Chapter fifty three, part three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume five. Chapter fifty three. Fate of the Eastern Empire, part three. The most lofty titles and the most humble postures, which devotion has applied to the Supreme Being, have been prostituted by flattery and fear to creatures of the same nature with ourselves. The mode of adoration, of falling prostrate on the ground and kissing the feet of the Emperor, was borrowed by Diocletian from Persian servitude, but it was continued and aggravated till the last age of the Greek monarchy, excepting only on Sundays when it was waved from a motive of religious pride. This humiliating reverence was extracted from all who entered the royal presence, from the princes invested with the diadem and purple, and from the ambassadors who represented their independent sovereigns, the caliphs of Asia, Egypt, or Spain, the kings of France and Italy, and the Latin emperors of ancient Rome. In his transactions of business, Lutprand, bishop of Cremonia, asserted the free spirit of a Frank and the dignity of his master, Otho. Yet his sincerity cannot disguise the abasement of his first audience. When he approached the throne, the birds of the golden tree began to warble their notes, which were accompanied by the roarings of two lions of gold. With his two companions, Lutprand was compelled to bow and to fall prostrate, and thrice to touch the ground with his forehead. He arose, but in the short interval the throne had been hoisted from the floor to the ceiling, the imperial figure appeared in new and more gorgeous apparel, and the interview was concluded in haughty and majestic silence. In this honest and curious narrative, the bishop of Cremona represents the ceremonies of the Byzantine court, which are still practised in the sublime port, and which were preserved in the last ages by the dukes of Muscovy or Russia. After a long journey by sea and land from Venice to Constantinople, the ambassador halted at the Golden Gate, till he was conducted by the formal officers to the hospitable palace prepared for his reception. But this palace was a prison, and his jealous keepers prohibited all social intercourse either with strangers or natives. At his first audience, he offered the gifts of his master, slaves and golden vases and costly armour. The ostentatious payment of the officers and troops displayed before his eyes the riches of the empire. He was entertained at a royal banquet, in which the ambassadors of the nations were marshalled by the esteem or contempt of the Greeks. From his own table, the emperor, as the most signal favour, sent the plates which he had tasted, and his favourites were dismissed with a robe of honour. In the morning and evening of each day, his civil and military servants attended their duty in the palace. Their labours were repaid by the sight, perhaps by the smile of their lord. His commands were signified by a nod or a sign. But all earthly greatness stood silent and submissive in his presence. In his regular or extraordinary processions through the capital, he unveiled his person to the public view. The rites of policy were connected with those of religion, and his visits to the principal churches were regulated by the festivals of the Greek calendar. On the eve of these processions, the gracious or devout intention of the monarch was proclaimed by the heralds. The streets were cleared and purified, the pavement was strewn with flowers, the most precious furniture, the gold and silver plate and silken hangings, were displayed from the windows and balconies, and a severe discipline restrained and silenced the tumult of the populace. The march was opened by the military officers at the head of their troops. They were followed in long order by the magistrates and ministers of the civil government. The person of the emperor was guarded by his eunuchs and domestics, and at the church door he was solemnly received by the patriarch and his clergy. The task of applause was not abandoned to the rude and spontaneous voice of the crowd. The most convenient stations were occupied by the bands of the blue and green factions of the circus, 
and their furious conflicts, which had shaken the capital, were insensibly sunk to an emulation of servitude. For me the side they echoed in responsive melody the praises of the emperor. Their poets and musicians directed the choir, and long life and victory were the burden of every song. The same acclamations were performed at the audience, the banquet, and the church, and as an evidence of boundless sway, they were repeated in Latin, Gothic, Persian, French, and even English language, by the mercenaries who sustained the real or fictitious character of those nations. By the pen of Constantine Porphogenitus, this science of form and flattery had been reduced into a pompous and trifling volume, which the vanity of succeeding times might enrich with an ample supplement. Yet the calmer reflection of a prince would surely suggest that the same acclamations were applied to every character in every reign, and if he had risen from a private rank, he might remember that his own voice had been the loudest and most eager in applause, at the very moment when he envied the fortune, or conspired against the life of his predecessor. The princes of the north, of the nation, says Constantine, without faith or fame, were ambitious of mingling their blood with the blood of the Caesars, by their marriage with a royal virgin, or by the nuptials of their daughters with a Roman prince. The aged monarch, in his instructions to his son, reveals the secret maxims of policy and pride, and suggests the most decent reasons for refusing these insolent and unreasonable demands. Every animal, says the discreet emperor, is prompted by the distinction of language, religion, and manners. A just regard to the purity of descent preserves the harmony of public and private life. But the mixture of foreign blood is the fruitful source of disorder and discord. Such had ever been the opinion and practice of the sage Romans. Their jurisprudence prescribed the marriage of a citizen and a stranger. In the days of freedom and virtue, a senator would have scorned to match his daughter with a king. The glory of Mark Antony was sullied by an Egyptian wife, and the emperor Titus was compelled, by popular censure, to dismiss with reluctance the reluctant Bernice. This perpetual interdict was ratified by the fabulous sanction of the great Constantine. The ambassadors of the nations, more especially of the unbelieving nations, were solemnly admonished, that such strange alliances had been condemned by the founder of the church and city. The irrevocable law was inscribed on the altar of St. Sophia, and the impious prince who should stain the majesty of the purple was excluded from the civil and ecclesiastical communion of the Romans. If the ambassadors were instructed by any false brethren in the Byzantine history, they might produce three memorable examples of the violation of this imaginary law. The marriage of Leo, or rather of his father Constantine the Fourth, with the daughter of the king of the Shazars, the nuptials of the granddaughter of Romanus with a Bulgarian prince, and the union of Bertha of France or Italy with young Romanus, the son of Constantine Porphogenitus himself. To these objections three answers were prepared, which solved the difficulty and established the law. The deed and guilt of Constantine Corponimus were acknowledged. The Isaurian heretic, who sullied the baptismal font and declared war against the holy images, had indeed embraced a barbarian wife. By this impious alliance he accomplished the measures of his crime, and was devoted to the just cause of and was devoted to the just censure of the one. The deed and guilt of Constantine Corponimus were acknowledged. The Assyrian heretic, who sullied the baptismal font and declared war against the holy images, had indeed embraced a barbarian wife. By this impious alliance he accomplished the measure of his crimes, and was devoted to the just censure of the church and of posterity. 2. Romanus could not be alleged as a legitimate emperor. He was a plebeian usurper, ignorant of the laws and regardless of the honour of the monarchy. His son Christopher, the father of the bride, was the third in rank in the college of princes, at once the subject and the accomplice of a rebellious parent. The Bulgarians were sincere and devout Christians, 
and the safety of the empire, with the redemption of many thousand captives, depended on this preposterous alliance. Yet no consideration could dispense from the laws of Constantine. The clergy, the senate, and the people disapproved the conduct of Romanus, and he was reproached both in his life and death as the author of the public disgrace. 3. For the marriage of his own son with the daughter of Hugo, king of Italy, a more honourable defence is contrived by the wise Porphyrogenitus. Constantine, the great and holy, esteemed the fidelity and valour of the Franks, and his prophetic spirit beheld the vision of their future greatness. They alone were accepted from the general prohibition. Hugo, king of France, was the lineal descendant of Charlemagne, and his daughter Bertha inherited the prerogatives of her family and nation. The voice of truth and malice insensibly betrayed the fraud or error of the imperial court. The patrimonial estate of Hugo was reduced from the monarchy of France to the simple country of Arles, though it was not denied that, in the confusion of the times, he had usurped the sovereignty of province, and invaded the kingdom of Italy. His father was a private noble, and if Bertha derived her female descent from the Carlovingian line, every step was polluted with illegitimacy or vice. The grandmother of Hugo was the famous Valdara, the concubine, rather than the wife, of the second Lothar, whose adultery, divorce, and second nuptials had provoked against him the thunders of the Vatican. His mother, as she was styled, the great Bertha, was successfully the wife of the Count of Arles and of the Marquess of Tuscany. France and Italy were scandalized by her gallantries, and, till the age of threescore, her lovers of every degree were the zealous servants of her ambition. The example of maternal incontinence was copied by the King of Italy, and the three favourite concubines of Hugo were decorated with the classic names of Venus, Juno, and Semele. The daughter of Venus was granted to the solicitations of the Byzantine court. Her name of Bertha was changed to that of Eudoxa, and she was wedded, or rather betrothed, to young Romanus, the future heir of the Empire of the East. The consummation of this foreign alliance was suspended by the tender age of the two parties, and, at the end of five years, the union was dissolved by the death of the virgin spouse. The second wife of the Emperor Romanus was a maiden of plebeian, but of Roman birth, and their two daughters, Theophano and Anne, were given in marriage to the princes of the earth. The eldest was bestowed, as the pledge of peace, on the eldest son of the great Otho, who had solicited this alliance with arms and embassies. It might legally be questioned how far a Saxon was entitled to the privilege of the French nation, but every scruple was silenced by the fame and piety of a hero who had restored the empire of the West. After the death of her father-in-law and husband, Theophano governed Rome, Italy and Germany during the minority of her son, the third Otho and the Latins have praised the virtues of an empress, who sacrificed to a superior duty the remembrance of her country. In the nuptials of her sister Anne, every prejudice was lost, and every consideration of dignity was superseded, but the stronger argument of necessity and fear. A pagan of the north, Wolodomir, great prince of Russia, aspired to a daughter of the Roman purple, and his claim was enforced by the threats of war, the promise of conversion, and the offer of a powerful succour against a domestic rebel. A victim of her religion and country, the Grecian princess was torn from the palace of her fathers, and condemned to a savage reign, and a hopeless exile on the banks of the Borysthenes, or in the neighbourhood of the polar circle. Yet the marriage of Anne was fortunate and fruitful. The daughter of her grandson, Jerusalus, was recommended by her imperial descent, and the king of France, Henry I, sought a wife on the last borders of Europe and Christendom. In the Byzantine palace, the emperor was the first slave of the ceremonies which he imposed, 
of the rigid forms which regulated each word and gesture, besieged him in the palace, and violated the leisure of his rural solitude. But the lives and fortunes of millions hung on his arbitrary will, and the firmest minds, superior to the allurements of pomp and luxury, may be seduced by the more active pleasure of commanding their equals. The legislative and executive powers were centred in the person of the monarch, and the last remains of the authority of the senate were finally eradicated by Leo the philosopher. A lethargy of servitude had benumbed the minds of the Greeks. In the wildest tumults of rebellion they never aspired to the idea of a free constitution. And the private character of the prince was the only source and measure of their public happiness. Superstition riveted their chains. In the church of St. Sophia he was solemnly crowned by the patriarch. At the foot of the altar they pledged their passive and unconditional obedience to his government and family. On his side he engaged to abstain as much as possible from the capital punishments of death and mutilation. His orthodox creed was subscribed with his own hand, and he promised to obey the decrees of the seven synoids and the canons of the holy church. But the assurance of mercy was loose and indefinite. He swore, not to his people, but to an invisible judge. And, except the inexpiable guilt of heresy, the ministers of heaven were always prepared to preach the indefeasible right, and to absolve the venial transgressions of their sovereign. The Greek ecclesiasticals were themselves the subjects of the civil magistrate. At the nod of a tyrant, the bishops were created, or transferred, or deposed, or punished with an ignominious death. Whatever might be their wealth or influence, they could never succeed like the Latin clergy in the establishment of an independent republic. And the patriarch of Constantinople condemned, what he secretly envied, the temporal greatness of his Roman brother. Yet the exercise of boundless despotism is happily checked by the laws of nature and necessity. In proportion to his wisdom and virtue, the master of an empire is confined to the path of his sacred and laborious duty. In proportion to his vice and folly, he drops the sceptre too weighty for his hands, and the motions of the royal image are ruled by the imperceptible thread of some minister or favourite, who undertakes for his private interest to exercise the task of the public oppression. In some fatal moment, the most absolute monarch may dread the reason or the caprice of a nation of slaves. And experience has proved that whatever is gained in the extent is lost in the safety and solidity of regal power. Whatever titles a despot may assume, whatever claims he may assert, it is on the sword that he must ultimately depend to guard him against his foreign and domestic enemies. From the age of Charlemagne to that of the Crusades, the world, for I overlook the remote monarchy of China, was occupied and disputed by the three great empires or nations of the Greeks, the Saracens, and the Franks. Their military strength may be ascertained by a comparison of their courage, their arts and riches, and their obedience to a supreme head, who might call into action all the energies of the state. The Greeks, far inferior to their rivals in the first, were superior to the Franks, and at least equal to the Saracens in the second and third of these warlike qualifications. The wealth of the Greeks enabled them to purchase the service of the poorer nations, and to maintain a naval power for the protection of their coasts and the annoyance of their enemies. A commerce of the mutual benefit exchanged the gold of Constantinople, for the blood of Sclovians and Turks, the Bulgarians and Russians. Their valour contributed to the victories of Nicephorus and Zimisces. And if a hostile people pressed too closely on the frontier, they were recalled to the defence of their country, and the desire of peace, by the well-managed attack of a more distant tribe. The command of the Mediterranean, from the mouth of the Tineus to the columns of Hercules, was always claimed and often possessed by the successors of Constantine. 
their capital was filled with naval stores and dexterous artifices. The situation of Greece and Asia, the long coasts, deep gulfs, and numerous islands, accustomed their subjects to the exercise of navigation. And the trade of Venice and Amalfi supplied a nursery of seamen to the imperial fleet. Since the time of the Peloponnesian and Punic wars, the sphere of action had not been enlarged and the science of naval architecture appears to have declined. The art of constructing these stupendous machines which displayed three, or six, or ten ranges of oars, rising above or falling behind each other, was unknown to the shipbuilders of Constantinople, as well as to the, me as well as to the mechanician of modern days. The Dramones, or light galleys of the Byzantine Empire, were content with two tier of oars. Each tier was composed of five-and-twenty benches, and two rowers were seated on each bench, who plied their oars on either side of the vessel. To these we must add the captain or centurion, who, in time of action, stood erect with his armour-bearer on the poop, two steersmen at the helm, and two officers at the prow, the one to manage the anchor, the other to point and play against the enemy the tube of liquid fire. The whole crew, as in the infancy of the art, performed the double service of mariners and soldiers. They were provided with defensive and offensive arms, with bows and arrows, which they used from the upper deck, with long pikes, which they pushed through the portholes of the lower tier. Sometimes, indeed, the ships of war were of a larger and more solid construction, and the labours of combat and navigation were more regularly divided between seventy soldiers and two hundred and thirty mariners. But, for the most part, they were of the light and manageable size. And, as the Cape of Malaya in Peloponnesus was still clothed with its ancient terrors, an imperial fleet was transported five miles over land across the Isthmus of Corinth, the principles of maritime tactics had not undergone any change since the time of Thucydides. A squadron of galleys still advanced in a crescent, charged to the front, and strove to impel their sharp beaks against the feeble sides of their antagonists. A machine for casting stones and darts was built of strong timbers in the midst of the deck, and the operation of boarding was effected by a crane that hosted baskets of armed men. The language of signals, so clear and copious in the naval grammar of the moderns, was imperfectly expressed by the various positions and colours of a commanding flag. In the darkness of the night, the same orders, to chase, to attack, to halt, to retreat, to break, to form, were conveyed by the lights of the leading galley. By land, the fire signals were repeated from one mountain to another, a chain of eight stations commanded a space of five hundred miles, and Constantinople in a few hours was appraised of the hostile motions of the Saracens of Tarsus. Some estimate may be formed of the power of the Greek emperors, by the curious and minute detail of the armament which was prepared for the reduction of Crete. A fleet of one hundred and twelve galleys and seventy-five vessels of the Pamphylian style were equipped in the capital, the islands of the Aegean Sea, and the seaports of Asia, Macedonia, and Greece. It carried thirty-four thousand mariners, seven thousand three hundred and forty soldiers, seven hundred Russians, and five thousand and eighty-seven maridates, whose fathers had been transplanted from the mountains of Libanus. Their pay, most probably of a month, was computed at thirty-four centenaries of gold, about one hundred and thirty-six thousand pounds sterling. Our fancy is bewildered by the endless recapitulation of arms and engines, of clothes and linen, of bread for the men and of forage for the horses, and of stores and utensils of every description, inadequate to the conquest of a petty island, but amply sufficient for the establishment of a flourishing colony. The invention of the Greek fire did not, like that of gunpowder, produce a total revolution in the art of war. To these liquid combustibles, the city and empire of Constantine owed their deliverance, 
and they were employed in sieges and sea-fights with terrible effect. But they were either less improved or less susceptible of improvement. The engines of antiquity, the catapult, ballista, and battering rams, were still of most frequent and powerful use in the attack and defence of fortifications. Nor was the decision of battles reduced to the quick and heavy fire of a line of infantry, whom it were fruitless to protect with armour against a similar fire of their enemies. Steel and iron were still the common instruments of destruction and safety, and the helmets, cuirasses, and shields of the tenth century did not, either in form or substance, essentially differ from those which had covered the champions of Alexander or Achilles. But, instead of accustoming the modern Greeks, like the legionnaires of old, to the constant and easy use of this sultry weight, their armors laid aside in light chariots, which followed the march, till, on the approach of an enemy, they resumed with haste and reluctance the unusual encumbrance. Their offensive weapons consisted of swords, battle-axes, and spears, but the Macedonian pike was shortened a fourth of its length, and reduced to the more convenient measure of twelve cubits or feet. The sharpness of the Scythian and Arabian arrows had been severely felt, and the emperors lament the decay of archery as a cause of the public misfortunes, and recommended, as an advice and a command, that the military youth, till the age of forty, should assiduously practise the exercise of the bow. The bands, or regiments, were usually three hundred strong, and, as a medium between the extremes of four and sixteen, the foot-soldiers of Leo and Constantine were formed eight deep. But the cavalry charged in four ranks, from the reasonable consideration that the weight of the front could not be increased by any pressure of the hindermost horses. If the ranks of the infantry or cavalry were sometimes doubled, this cautious array betrayed a secret distrust of the courage of the troops, whose numbers might swell the appearance of the line, but of whom only a chosen band would dare to encounter the spears and swords of the barbarians. The order of the battle must have varied according to the ground, the object, and the adversary. But their ordinary disposition, in two lines and a reserve, presented a succession of hopes and resources most agreeable to the temper as well as the judgment of the Greeks. In case of a repulse, the first line fell back into the intervals of the second, and the reserve, breaking into two divisions, wheeled round the Franks to improve the victory or cover the retreat. Whatever authority could enact was accomplished, at least in theory, by the camps and marches, the exercises and evolutions, the edicts and books of the Byzantine monarch. Whatever art could have produced from the forge, the loom, or the laboratory, was abundantly supplied by the riches of the prince, and the industry of his numerous workmen. But neither authority nor art could frame the most important machine, the soldier himself. And if the ceremonies of Constantine always supposed a safe and triumphal return of the emperor, his tactics seldom saw above the means of escaping a defeat and procrastinating the war. Notwithstanding some transient success, the Greeks were sunk in their own esteem and that of their neighbours. A cold hand and a curious tongue were the vulgar description of a nation. The author of the tactics was besieged in his capital, and the last of the barbarians, who trembled at the name of the Saracens or Franks, could proudly exhibit the medals of gold and silver which they had exhorted from the feeble sovereign of Constantinople. What spirit their government and character denied might have been inspired in some degree by the influence of religion but the religion of the Greeks could only teach them to suffer and to yield. The emperor Nicephorus, who restored for a moment the discipline and glory of the Roman name, was desirous of bestowing the honours of martyrdom on the Christians, who lost their lives in a holy war against the infidels. But this political law was defeated by the opposition of the patriarch, the bishops, and the principal senators and they strenuously urged the canons of St. Basil, that all who were polluted by the bloody trade of a soldier should be separated, during three years, from the communion of the faithful. 
These scruples of the Greeks have been compared with the tears of the primitive Moslems, when they were held back from battle, and this contrast of base superstition and high-spirited enthusiasm unfolds to a philosophic eye the history of the rival nations. The subjects of the last caliphs had undoubtedly degenerated from the zeal and faith of the companions of the Prophet, yet their martial creed still represented the deity as the author of war. The vital, though latent spark of fanaticism, the vital, though latent spark of fanaticism, still glowed in the heart of their religion, and among the Saracens, who dwelt on the Christian borders, it was frequently rekindled to a lively and active flame. Their regular force was formed of the valiant slaves, who had been educated to guard the person and accompany the standard of their lord. But the Muslim and people of Syria and Sicilia, of Africa and Spain, were awakened by the trumpet which proclaimed a holy war against the infidels. The rich were ambitious of death or victory in the cause of God, the poor were eluded by the hopes of plunder, and the old, the infirm, and the women assumed their share of meritorious service by sending their substitutes, with arms and horses, into the field. These offensive and defensive arms were similar in strength and temper to those of the Romans, whom they far excelled in the management of the horse and the bow. The massy silver of their belts, their bridles, and their swords displayed the magnificence of a prosperous nation, and except some black archers of the south, the Arabs disdained the naked bravery of their ancestors. Instead of wagons they were attended by a long train of camels, mules, and asses. The multitude of these animals, whom they bedecked with flags and streamers, appeared to swell the pomp and magnitude of their host and the horses of the enemy were often disordered by the uncouth figure and odious smell of the camels of the east. Invincible by their patience of thirst and heat, their spirits were frozen by a winter's cold, and the consciousness of their propensity to sleep exacted the most rigorous precautions against the surprises of the night. Their order of battle was a long square of two deep and solid lines, the first of archers, the second of cavalry, in their engagements by sea and land, they sustained with patient firmness the fury of the attack, and seldom advanced to the charge till they could discern and oppress the lassitude of their foes. But if they were repulsed and broken, they knew not how to rally or renew the combat, and their dismay was heightened by the superstitious prejudice that God had declared himself on the side of their enemies. The decline and fall of the caliphs countenanced their fearful opinion, nor were there wanting, among the Mohammedans and Christians, some obscure prophecies which prognosticated their alternate defeats. The unity of the Arabian Empire was dissolved, but the independent fragments were equal to populous and powerful kingdoms, and in their navy and military armaments, an emir of Aleppo or Tunis, might command no despicable fund of skill and industry and treasure. In their transactions of peace and war with the Saracens, the princes of Constantinople too often felt that these barbarians had nothing barbarous in their discipline, and, if they were destitute of original genius, they had been endowed with a quick spirit of curiosity and imitation. The model was indeed more perfect than the copy, their ships and engines and fortifications were of a less skilful construction, and they confess without shame that the same God who has given a tongue to the Arabians had more nicely fashioned the hands of the Chinese and the heads of the Greeks. End of chapter 53, part 3《Of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. Chapter 53. Fate of the Eastern Empire, Part 4. 
a name of some German tribes between the Rhine and the Weiser, had spread his victorious influence over the greatest part of Gaul, Germany, and Italy, and the common appellation of Franks was applied by the Greeks and Arabians to the Christians of the Latin Church, the nations of the West, who stretched beyond their knowledge to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. The vast body had been inspired and united by the soul of Charlemagne, but the division and degeneracy of his race soon annihilated the imperial power, which would have rivalled the Caesars of Byzantium, and revenged the indignities of the Christian name. The enemies no longer feared, nor could the subjects any longer trust, the application of a public revenue, the labours of trade and manufactures in the military service, the mutual aid of provinces and armies, and the naval squadrons which were regularly stationed from the mouth of the Elbe to that of the Tiber. In the beginning of the tenth century, the family of Charlemagne had almost disappeared. His monarchy was broken into many hostile and independent states. The regal title was assumed by the most ambitious chiefs. Their revolt was imitated in a long subordination of anarchy and discord, and the nobles of every province disobeyed their sovereign, oppressed their vassals, and exercised perpetual hostilities against their equals and neighbours. Their private wars, which overturned the fabric of government, fermented the martial spirit of the nation. In the system of modern Europe, the power of the sword is possessed, at least in fact, by five or six mighty potentates. Their operations are conducted on a distant frontier, by an order of men who devote their lives to the study and practice of the military art. The rest of the country and community enjoys, in the midst of war, the tranquillity of peace, and is only made sensible of the change by the aggravation or decrease of the public taxes. In the disorders of the tenth and eleventh centuries, every peasant was a soldier, and every village a fortification. Each wood or valley was a scene of murder and rapine, and the lords of each castle were compelled to assume the character of princes and warriors. To their own courage and policy they boldly trusted for the safety of their family, the protection of their lands, and the revenge of their injuries. And, like the conquerors of a large size, they were too apt to transgress the privilege of defensive war. The powers of the mind and body were hardened by the presence of danger and necessity of resolution. The same spirit refused to desert a friend and to forgive an enemy. And, instead of sleeping under the guardian care of a magistrate, they proudly disdained the authority of the laws. In the days of feudal anarchy, the instruments of agriculture and art were converted into the weapons of bloodshed. The peaceful occupations of civil and ecclesiastical society were abolished or corrupted. And the bishop who exchanged his mitre for a helmet was more forcibly urged by the manners of the times than by the obligation of his tenure. The love of freedom and of arms was felt, with conscious pride, by the Franks themselves, and is observed by the Greeks with some degree of amazement and terror. The Franks, says the Emperor Constantine, a bold and valiant to the verge of termity. And their dauntless spirit is supported by the contempt of danger and death. In the field and in close onset, they press to the front, and rush headlong against the enemy, without deigning to compute either his numbers or their own. Their ranks are formed by the firm connections of consanguinity and friendship, and their martial deeds are prompted by the desire of saving or revenging their dearest companions. In their eyes, a retreat is a shameful flight, and flight is indelible infamy. A nation endowed with such high and intrepid spirit must have been secure of victory if these advantages had not been counterbalanced by many weighty defects. The decay of their naval power left the Greeks and Saracens in possession of the sea, for every purpose of annoyance and supply. In the age which preceded the institution of knighthood, the Franks were rude and unskilful in the service of cavalry, and in all perilous emergencies their warriors were so conscious of their ignorance that they chose to dismount from their horses and fight on foot. Unpractised in the use of pikes or of missile weapons, they were encumbered by the length of their swords, the weight of their armour, the magnitude of their shields, 
and, if I may repeat the satire of the meagre Greeks, by their unwieldy intemperance. Their independent spirit disdained the yoke of subordination, and abandoned the standard of their chief, if he attempted to keep the field beyond the term of their stipulation or service. On all sides they were open to the snares of an enemy less brave, but more artful than themselves. They might be bribed, for the barbarians were venial, or surprised in the night, for they neglected the precautions of a close encampment or vigilant sentinels. The fatigues of a summer's campaign exhausted their strength and patience, and they sunk in despair if their voracious appetite was disappointed of the plentiful supply of wine and of food. This general character of the Franks was marked with some national and local shades, which I should ascribe to accident rather than to climate, but which were visible both to natives and to foreigners. An ambassador of the great Otho declared, in the palace of Constantinople, that the Saxons could dispute with swords better than with pens, and that they preferred inevitable death to the dishonour of turning their backs to an enemy. It was the glory of the nobles of France, that in their humble dwellings war and rapine were the only pleasure, the sole occupation of their lives. They affected to deride the palaces, the banquets, the polished manner of the Italians, who, in the estimate of the Greeks themselves, had degenerated from the liberty and valour of the ancient Lombards. By the well-known edict of Caracalla, his subjects, from Britain to Egypt, were entitled to the name and privileges of Romans, and their national sovereign might fix his occasional or permanent residence in any province of their common country. In the division of the East and West, an ideal unity was scrupulously observed, and in their titles, laws, and statutes, the successors of Arcadius and Honorius announced themselves as the inseparable colleagues of the same office, as the joint sovereigns of the Roman world and city, which were bounded by the same limits. After the fall of the Western monarchy, the majesty of the purple resided solely in the princes of Constantinople. And of these, Justinian was the first who, after a divorce of sixty years, became the dominion of ancient Rome, and asserted, by the right of conquest, the august title of Emperor of the Romans. A motive of vanity or discontent solicited one of his successors, Constan II, to abandon the Thracian Bosphorus, and to restore the pristine honours of the Tiber. An extravagant project, exclaims the malicious Byzantine, as if he had despoiled a beautiful and blooming virgin, to enrich, or rather to expose, the deformity of a wrinkled and decrepit matron. But the sword of the Lombards opposed his settlement in Italy. He entered Rome not as a conqueror, but as a fugitive, and, after a visit of twelve days, he pillaged, and forever deserted, the ancient capital of the world. The final revolt and separation of Italy was accomplished about two centuries after the conquest of Justinian, and from his reign we may date the gradual oblivion of the Latin tongue. That legislator had composed his institutes, his code, and his pandects, in a language which he celebrates as the proper and public style of the Roman government. The consecrated idiom of the palace and senate of Constantinople, of the camps and tribunals of the East. But this foreign dialect was unknown to the people and soldiers of the Asiatic provinces. It was imperfectly understood by the greater part of the interpreters of the laws and the ministers of the state. After a short conflict, nature and habit prevailed over the obsolete institutions of human power. For the general benefit of his subjects, Justinian promulgated his novels in the two languages. The several parts of his voluminous jurisprudence were successively translated. The original was forgotten, the version was studied, and the Greek, whose intrinsic merit deserved indeed the preference, obtained a legal as well as a popular establishment in the Byzantine monarchy. The birth and residence of succeeding princes estranged them from the Roman idiom. Tiberius by the Arabs, and Morris by the Italians, are distinguished as the first of the Greek Caesars, as the founders of a new dynasty and empire. The silent revolution was accomplished before the death of Heraclius, 
and the ruins of the Latin speech were darkly preserved in the terms of jurisprudence and the acclamations of the palace. After the restoration of the Western Empire by Charlemagne and the Othos, the names of Franks and Latins acquired an equal signification and extent, and these haughty barbarians asserted, with some justice, their superior claim to the language and dominion of Rome. They insulted the alien of the East, who had renounced the dress and idiom of Romans. And their reasonable practice will justify the frequent appellation of Greeks. But this contemptuous appellation was indignantly rejected by the prince and people to whom it was applied. Whatsoever changes had been introduced by the lapse of ages, they alleged a lineal and unbroken succession from Augustus and Constantine. And, in the lowest period of degeneracy and decay, the name of Romans adhered to the last fragments of the empire of Constantinople. While the government of the East was transacted in Latin, the Greek was the language of literature and philosophy. Nor could the masters of this rich and perfect idiom be tempted to envy the borrowed learning and imitative taste of their Roman disciples. After the fall of paganism, the loss of Syria and Egypt, and the extinction of the schools of Alexandria and Athens, the studies of the Greeks insensibly retired to some regular monasteries, and, above all, to the royal college of Constantinople, which was burnt in the reign of Leo the Asaurian. In the pompous style of the age, the president of that foundation was named the son of science. His twelve associates, the professors in the different arts and faculties, were the twelve signs of the zodiac. A library of thirty-six thousand five hundred volumes was open to their inquiries, and they could show an ancient manuscript of Homer, on a roll of parchment one hundred and twenty feet in length, the intestines, as it was fabled, of a prodigious serpent. But the seventh and eighth centuries were a period of discord and darkness. The library was burnt, the college was abolished, the iconoclasts are represented as the foes of antiquity, and a savage ignorance and contempt of letters has disgraced the princes of the Heraclean and Isaurian dynasties. In the ninth century we trace the first drawings of the restoration of science. After the fanaticism of the Arabs had subsided, the caliphs aspired to conquer the arts rather than the provinces of the empire. Their liberal curiosity rekindled the emulation of the Greeks, brushed away the dust from their ancient libraries, and taught them to know and reward the philosophers, whose labours had been hitherto repaid by the pleasure of study and the pursuit of truth. The Caesar Bardas, the uncle of Michael the Third, was the generous protector of letters, a title which alone has preserved his memory and excused his ambition. A particle of the treasure of his nephew was sometimes diverted from the indulgence of vice and folly. A school was opened in the palace of Magnara, and the presence of Bardas excited the emulation of the masters and students. At their head was the philosopher Leo, archbishop of Thessalonica. His profound skill in astronomy and the mathematics was admired by the strangers of the East, and this occult science was magnified by vulgar credulity which modestly supposes that all knowledge superior to its own must be the effect of inspiration or magic. At the pressing entreaty of the Caesar, his friend, the celebrated Photius, renounced the freedom of a secular and studious life, ascended the patriarchal throne, and was alternatively excommunicated and absolved by the synods of the East and West. By the confession even of priestly hatred, no art or science, except poetry, was foreign to this universal scholar, who was deep in thought, indefatigable in reading, and eloquent in diction. Whilst he exercised the office of Protosapthir, or captain of the guards, Photius was sent ambassador to the caliph of Baghdad. The tedious hours of exile, perhaps of confinement, were beguiled by the hasty composition of his library, a living monument of erudition and criticism. Two hundred and fourscore writers, historians, orators, philosophers, theologians, are reviewed without any regular method. He abridges their narrative or doctrine, appreciates their style and character, 
and judges even the fathers of the church with a discreet freedom, which often breaks through the superstition of the times. The Emperor Basil, who lamented the defects of his own education, entrusted to the care of Photius his son and successor, Leo the philosopher, and the reign of that prince and of his son Constantine Porphogenitus forms one of the most prosperous eras of the Byzantine literature. By their munificence the treasures of antiquity were deposited in the imperial library. By their pens, or those of their associates, they were imparted in such extracts and abridgments as might amuse the curiosity, without oppressing the indolence of the public. Besides the basilics, or codes of law, the arts of husbandry and war, of feeding or destroying the human species, were propagated with equal diligence. And the history of Greece and Rome was digested into fifty-three heads or titles, of which two only, of embassies and of virtues and vices, have escaped the injuries of time. In every station the reader might contemplate the image of the past world, apply the lesson or warning of each page, and learn to admire, perhaps to imitate, the examples of a brighter period. I shall not expatiate on the works of the Byzantine Greeks, who, by the assiduous study of the ancients, have deserved, in some measure, the remembrance and gratitude of the moderns. The scholars of the present age may still enjoy the benefit of the philosophical commonplace book of Stobius, the grammatical and historical lexicon of Suidas, the Kiliads of Testes, which comprise six hundred narratives into twelve thousand verses, and the commentaries on Homer of Eustathius, Archbishop of Thessalonica, who, from his horn of plenty, has poured the names and authorities of four hundred writers. From these originals, and from the numerous tribe of scholiasts and critics, some estimate may be formed of the literary wealth of the twelfth century. Constantinople was enlightened by the genius of Homer and Demosthenes, of Aristotle and Plato, and in the enjoyment or neglect of our present riches, we must envy the generation that could still peruse the history of Thermopus, the orations of Hypades, the comedies of Menander, and the odes of Alcius and Sappho. The frequent labour of illustration attests not only the existence, but the popularity the general knowledge of the age may be deduced from the example of two learned females. The Empress Eudocia and the Princess Anna Comnemna, who cultivated in the purple the arts of rhetoric and philosophy. The vulgar dialect of the city was gross and barbarous. A more correct and elaborate style distinguished the discourse, or at least the compositions, of the church and palace, which sometimes affected to copy the purity of the Attic models. In our modern education, the painful though necessary attainment of two languages, which are no longer living, may consume the time and damp the ardour of the youthful student. The poets and orators were long imprisoned in the barbarous dialects of our western ancestors, devoid of, har devoid of harmony or grace, and their genius, without precept or example, was abandoned to the rural and native powers of their judgment and fancy. But the Greeks of Constantinople, after purging away the impurities of their vulgar speech, acquired the free use of their ancient language, the most happy composition of human art, and a familiar knowledge of the sublime masters who had pleased or instructed the first of nations. But these advantages only tend to aggravate the reproach and shame of a degenerate people. They held in their lifeless hands the riches of their fathers, without inheriting the spirit which had created and improved that sacred patrimony. They read, they praised, they complied, but their languid souls seemed alike incapable of thought and action. In the revolution of ten centuries, not a single discovery was made to exalt the dignity or promote the happiness of mankind. Not a single idea has been added to the speculative systems of antiquity, and a succession of patient disciples became in their turn the dogmatic teachers of the next servile generation. Not a single composition of history, philosophy, or literature 
has been saved from oblivion by the intrinsic beauties of style or sentiment, of original fancy, or even of successful imitation. In prose, the least offensive of the Byzantine writers are absolved from censure by their naked and unpresuming simplicity. But the orators, most eloquent in their own conceit, are the furthest removed from the models whom they affect to emulate. In every page our taste and reason are wounded by the choice of gigantic and obsolete words, a stiff and intricate phraseology, the discord of images, the childish play of false or unseasonable ornament, and the painful attempt to elevate themselves, to astonish the reader, and to evolve a trivial meaning in the smoke of obscurity and exaggeration. Their prose is soaring to the vicious affectation of poetry. Their poetry is sinking below the flatness and insipidity of prose. The tragic, epic, and lyric muses were silent and inglorious. The bards of Constantinople seldom rose above a riddle or epigram, a panegyric or tale. They forgot even the rules of prosody, and with the melody of Homer yet sounding in their ears, they confounded all measure of feet and syllables in the impotent strains which have received the name of political or city verses. The minds of the Greek were bound in the fetters of a base and imperious superstition, which extends her dominion round the circle of profane science. Their understandings were bewildered in metaphysical controversy. In the belief of visions and miracles, they had lost all principles of moral evidence and their taste was vitiates by the homilies of the monks, an absurd melody of declamation and scripture. Even these contemptible studies were no longer dignified by the abuse of superior talents. The leaders of the Greek church were humbly content to admire and copy the oracles of antiquity, nor did the schools of pulpit produce any rivals of the fame, nor did the schools of pulpit produce any rifles of the fame of Athanasius and Chrysostom. In the pursuits of active and speculative life, the emulation of states and individuals is the most powerful spring of the efforts and improvements of mankind. The cities of ancient Greece were cast in the happy mixture of union and independence, which is repeated on a larger scale, but in a looser form, by the nations of modern Europe. The union of language, religion, and manners, which renders them spectators and judges of each other's merit. The independence of government and interest, which asserts their separate freedom, and excites them to strive for preeminence in the career of glory. The situation of the Romans was less favourable, yet in the early ages of the Republic, which fixed the national character, a similar emulation was kindled among the states of Latium and Italy, and in the arts and science they aspired to equal or surpass their Grecian masters. The empire of the Caesars undoubtedly checked the activity and progress of the human mind. Its magnitude might indeed allow some scope for domestic competition. But when it was gradually receded, at first to the east, and at last to Greece and Constantinople, the Byzantine subjects were degraded to an abject and languid temper, the natural effect of their solitary and insulated state. From the north they were oppressed by nameless tribes of barbarians, to whom they scarcely imparted the appellation of man. The language and religion of the more polished Arabs was an insurmountable bar to all social intercourse. The conquerors of Europe were their brethren in the Christian faith, but the speech of the Franks or Latins was unknown, their manners were rude, and they were rarely connected, in peace or war, with the successors of Heraclius. Alone in the universe, the self-satisfied pride of the Greeks was not disturbed by the comparison of foreign merit. And it is no wonder if they fainted in the race, since they had neither competitors to urge their speed, nor judges to crown their victory. The nations of Europe and Asia were mingled by the expeditions to the Holy Land, and it is under the Comnenian dynasty that a faint emulation of knowledge and military virtue were rekindled in the Byzantine Empire. End of chapter 53, part 4《54 Part 1 of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Mead. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5, Chapter 54, Part 1. Chapter 54, Origin and Doctrine of the Paulicians. Part 1. Origin and Doctrine of the Paulicians, Their Persecution by the Greek Emperors, Revolt in Armenia, etc., Transplantation into Thrace, Propagation in the West, The Seeds, Character, and Consequences of the Reformation. In the profession of Christianity, the variety of national characters may be clearly distinguished. The natives of Syria and Egypt abandoned their lives to lazy and contemplative devotion. Rome again aspired to the dominion of the world, and the wit of the lively and loquacious Greeks was consumed in the disputes of metaphysical theology. The incomprehensible mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation, instead of commanding their silent submission, were agitated in vehement and subtle controversies, which enlarged their faith at the expense, perhaps, of their charity and reason. From the Council of Nice to the end of the seventh century, the peace and unity of the Church was invaded by these spiritual wars, and so deeply did they affect the decline and fall of the Empire, that the historian has too often been compelled to attend the synods, to explore the creeds, and to enumerate the sects of this busy period of ecclesiastical annals. From the beginning of the 8th century to the last ages of the Byzantine Empire, the sound of controversy was seldom heard. Curiosity was exhausted, zeal was fatigued, and in decrees of six councils the articles of the Catholic faith have been irrevocably defined. The spirit of dispute, however vain and pernicious, requires some energy and exercise of the mental faculties, and the prostrate Greeks were content to fast, to pray, and to believe in blind obedience to the patriarch and his clergy. During a long dream of superstition, the Virgin and the saints, their visions and miracles, their relics and images, were preached by the monks and worshipped by the people, and the appellation of people might be extended without injustice to the first ranks of civil society. At an unseasonable moment, the Isaurian emperors attempted somewhat rudely to awaken their subjects. Under their influence, reason might obtain some proselytes. A far greater number was swayed by interest or fear. But the Eastern world embraced or deplored their visible deities, and the restoration of images was celebrated as the Feast of Orthodoxy. In this passive and unanimous state, the ecclesiastical rulers were relieved from the toil were deprived of the pleasure of persecution. The pagans had disappeared, the Jews were silent and obscure, the disputes with the Latins were rare and remote hostilities against a national enemy, and the sects of Egypt and Syria enjoyed a free toleration under the shadow of the Arabian caliphs. About the middle of the seventh century, a branch of Manichaeans was selected as the victims of spiritual tyranny. Their patience was at length exasperated to despair and rebellion, and their exile has scattered over the West the seeds of reformation. These important events will justify some inquiry into the doctrine and story of the Paulicians, and as they cannot plead for themselves, our candid criticism will magnify the good and abate or suspect the evil that is reported by their adversaries. The Gnostics, who had distracted the infancy, were oppressed by the greatness and authority of the Church. Instead of emulating or surpassing the wealth, learning, and numbers of the Catholics, their obscure remnant was driven from the capitals of the East and West, and confined to the villages and mountains along the borders of the Euphrates. Some vestige of the Marcionites may be detected in the 5th century, but the numerous sects were finally lost in the odious name of the Manichaeans, and these heretics who presumed to reconcile the doctrines of Zoroaster and Christ, were pursued by the two religions with equal and unrelenting hatred. Under the grandson of Heraclius, in the neighborhood of Semisoda, more famous for the birth of Lucian than for the title of a Syrian kingdom, a reformer arose, esteemed by the Paulicians as the chosen messenger of truth. In his humble dwelling of Mananalus, Constantine entertained a deacon who 
who returned from Syrian captivity and received the inestimable gift of the New Testament, which was already concealed from the vulgar by the prudence of the Greek and perhaps of the Gnostic clergy. These books became the measure of his studies and the rule of his faith, and the Catholics, who dispute his interpretation, acknowledged that his text was genuine and sincere. But he attached himself with particular devotion to the writings and character of St. Paul. The name of the Paulicians is derived by their enemies from some unknown and domestic teacher, but I am confident that they gloried in their affinity to the Apostle of the Gentiles. His disciples, Titus, Timothy, Silvanus, Tychicus, were represented by Constantine and his fellow laborers. The names of the apostolic churches were applied to the congregations which they assembled in Armenia and Cappadocia, and this innocent allegory revived the example and memory of the first ages. In the Gospel and the Epistles of St. Paul, his faithful follower investigated the creed of primitive Christianity, and whatever might be the success, a Protestant reader will applaud the spirit of the inquiry. But if the scriptures of the Paulicians were pure, they were not perfect. Their founders rejected the two epistles of St. Peter, the apostle of the circumcision, whose dispute with their favorite for the observance of the law could not easily be forgiven. They agree with their Gnostic brethren in the universal contempt for the Old Testament, the book of Moses and the prophets, which have been consecrated by the decrees of the Catholic Church. With equal boldness, and doubtless with more reason, Constantine, the new Sylvanus, disclaimed the visions which, in so many bulky and splendid volumes, had been published by the Oriental sects, the fabulous productions of the Hebrew patriarchs and the sages of the East, the spurious gospels, epistles, and acts which in the first age had overwhelmed the orthodox code, the theology of Manus and the authors of the kindred heresies, and the thirty generations or eons which had been created by the fruitful fancy of Valentine. The Paulicians sincerely condemned the memory and opinions of the Manichaean sect, and complained of the injustice which imprisoned that invidious name on the simple votaries of St. Paul and of Christ. Of the ecclesiastical chain, many links had been broken by the Paulician reformers, and their liberty was enlarged as they reduced the number of masters at whose voice profane reason must bow to mystery and miracle. The early separation of the Gnostics had preceded the establishment of the Catholic worship, and against the gradual innovations of discipline and doctrine, they were strongly guarded by habit and aversion, as by the silence of St. Paul and the Evangelists. The objects which had been transformed by the magic of superstition appeared to the eyes of the Paulicians in their genuine and naked colors. An image made without hands was the common workmanship of a mortal artist, to whose skill alone the wood and canvas must be indebted for their merit or value. The miraculous relics were a heap of bones and ashes, destitute of life or virtue, or of any relation, perhaps, with the person to whom they were ascribed. The true and vivifying cross was a piece of sound or rotten timber, the body and blood of Christ, a loaf of bread and a cup of wine, the gifts of nature and the symbols of grace. The mother of God was degraded from her celestial honors and immaculate virginity, and the saints and angels were no longer solicited to exercise the laborious office of meditation in heaven and ministry upon earth. In the practice, or at least in the theory, of the sacraments, the Paulicians were inclined to abolish all visible objects of worship, and the words of the gospel were, in their judgment, the baptism and communion of the faithful. They indulged a convenient latitude for the interpretation of Scripture, and as often as they were pressed by the literal sense, they could escape to the intricate mazes of figure and allegory. Their utmost diligence must have been employed to dissolve the connection between the Old and the New Testament, since they adored the latter as the oracles of God, and abhorred the former as the fabulous and absurd invention of men or demons. We cannot be surprised that they should have found in the gospel the orthodox mystery of the Trinity, 
but instead of confessing the human nature and substantial sufferings of Christ, they amused their fancy with a celestial body that passed through the Virgin like water through a pipe, with a fantastic crucifixion that eluded the vain and important malice of the Jews. A creed thus simple and spiritual was not adapted to the genius of the times, and the rational Christian, who might have been contented with the light yoke and easy burden of Jesus and his apostles, was justly offended that the Paletians should dare to violate the unity of God, the first article of natural and revealed religion. Their belief and their trust was in the Father, of Christ, of the human soul, and of the invisible world. But they likewise held the eternity of matter, a stubborn and rebellious substance, the origin of a second principle of an active being who has created this visible world and exercises his temporal reign till the final consummation of death and sin. The appearances of moral and physical evil had established the two principles in the ancient philosophy and religion of the East, from whence this doctrine was transfused to the various swarms of the Gnostics. A thousand shades may be devised in the nature and character of Ariman, from a rival god to a subordinate demon, from passion and frailty to pure and perfect malevolence. But, in spite of our efforts, the goodness and the power of Ormuz are placed at the opposite extremities of the line, and every step that approaches the one must recede in equal proportion from the other. The apostolic labors of Constantine Sylvanus soon multiplied the number of his disciples, the secret recompense of spiritual ambition. The remnant of the Gnostic sects, and especially the Manichaeans of Armenia, were united under his standard. Many Catholics were converted or seduced by his arguments, and he preached with success in the regions of Pontus and Cappadocia, which had long since imbibed the religion of Zoroaster. The Paulician teachers were distinguished only by their scriptural names, by the modest title of fellow pilgrims, by the austerity of their lives, their zeal or knowledge, and the credit of some extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit. But they were incapable of desiring, or at least of obtaining, the wealth and honors of the Catholic prelacy. Such anti-Christian pride they bitterly censured, and even the ranks of elders or presbyters was condemned as an institution of the Jewish synagogue. The new sect was loosely spread over the provinces of Asia Minor to the westward of the Euphrates. Six of their principal congregations represented the churches to which St. Paul had addressed his epistles, and their founder chose his residence in the neighborhood of Colonia, in the same district of Pontus which had been celebrated by the altars of Bologna, and the miracles of Gregory. After a mission of twenty-seven years, Sylvanus, who had retired from the tolerating government of the Arabs, fell a sacrifice to Roman persecution. The laws of the pious emperors, which seldom touched the lives of less odious heretics, proscribed without mercy or disguise the tenets, the books, and the persons of the Montanists and Manichaeans. The books were delivered to the flames, and all who should presume to secrete such writings or to profess such opinions were devoted to an ignominious death. A Greek minister, armed with legal and military powers, appeared at Colonia to strike the shepherd and to reclaim, if possible, the lost sheep. By a refinement of cruelty, Simeon placed the unfortunate Sylvanus before a line of his disciples who were commanded, as the price of their pardon and the proof of their repentance, to massacre their spiritual father. They turned aside from the impious office. The stones dropped from their filial hands, and of the whole number, only one executioner could be found, a new David, as he is styled by the Catholics, who boldly overthrew the giant of heresy. This apostate, Justin was his name, again deceived and betrayed his unsuspecting brethren, and a new conformity to the Acts of St. Paul may be found in the conversion of Simeon. Like the apostle, he embraced the doctrine which he had been sent to persecute, renounced his honors and fortunes, 
and required among the Paulicians the fame of a missionary and a martyr. They were not ambitious of martyrdom, but in a calamitous period of one hundred and fifty years their patience sustained whatever zeal could inflict, and power was insufficient to eradicate the obstinate vegetation of fanaticism and reason. From the blood and ashes of the first victims, a succession of teachers and congregations repeatedly arose. Amidst their foreign hostilities, they found leisure for domestic quarrels. They preached, they disputed, they suffered. And the virtues, the apparent virtues, of Sergius, in a pilgrimage of thirty-three years, are reluctantly confessed by the orthodox historians. The native cruelty of Justinian the Second was stimulated by a pious cause, and he vainly hoped to extinguish, in a single conflagration, the name and memory of the Paulicians. By their primitive simplicity, their abhorrence of popular superstition, the iconoclast princes might have been reconciled to some erroneous doctrines, but they themselves were exposed to the calumnies of the monks, and they chose to be the tyrants, lest they should be accused as the accomplices of the Manichaeans. Such a reproach has sullied the clemency of Nicephorus, who relaxed in their favor the severity of the penal statutes, nor will his character sustain the honor of a more liberal motive. The feeble Michael I, the rigid Leo the Armenian, were foremost in the race of persecution, but the prize must doubtless be adjudged to the sanguinary devotion of Theodora who restored the images to the Oriental Church. Her inquisitors explored the cities and mountains of the Lesser Asia, and the flatterers of the Empress have affirmed that, in a short reign, one hundred thousand Paulicians were extirpated by the sword, the gibbet, or the flames. Her guilt or merit has perhaps been stretched beyond the measure of truth, but if the account be allowed, it must be presumed that many simple iconoclasts were punished under a more odious name, and that some who were driven from the church unwillingly took refuge in the bosom of heresy. The most furious and desperate of rebels are the sectaries of a religion long persecuted and at length provoked. In a holy cause they are no longer susceptible of fear or remorse. The justice of their arms hardens them against the feelings of humanity, and they revenge their father's wrongs on the children of their tyrants. Such have been the Hussites of Bohemia and the Calvinists of France, and such in the ninth century were the Paulicians of Armenia and the adjacent provinces. They were first awakened to the massacre of a governor and bishop who exercised the imperial mandate of converting or destroying the heretics, and the deepest recesses of Mount Argaeus protected their independence and revenge. A more dangerous and consuming flame was kindled by the persecution of Theodora and the revolt of Carbeus, a valiant Paulician who commanded the guards of the general of the East. His father had been impaled by the Catholic inquisitors, and religion, or at least nature, might justify his desertion and revenge. Five thousand of his brethren were united by the same motives. They renounced the allegiance of anti-Christian Rome, a Saracen emir introduced Carbeus to the caliph, and the commander of the faithful extended his scepter to the implacable enemy of the Greeks. In the mountains between Siwas and Trebizond, he founded or fortified the city of Tefrica, which is still occupied by a fierce or licentious people, and the neighboring hills were covered with the Paulician fugitives, who now reconciled the use of the Bible and the sword. During more than thirty years, Asia was afflicted by the calamities of foreign and domestic war. In their hostile inroads, the disciples of St. Paul were joined with those of Mohammed, and the peaceful Christians, the aged parent and tender virgin, who were delivered into barbarous servitude, might justly accuse the intolerant spirit of their sovereign. So urgent was the mischief, so intolerable the shame, that even the dissolute Michael, the son of Theodora, was compelled to march in person against the Paulicians. He was defeated under the walls of Samosota, and the Roman emperor fled before the heretics whom his mother had condemned to the flames. 
The Saracens fought under the same banner, but the victory was ascribed to Carbeus, and the captive generals, with more than a hundred tribunes, were either released by his avarice or tortured by his fanaticism. The valor and ambition of Chrysocheir, his successor, embraced a wider circle of rapine and revenge. In alliance with his faithful Moslems, he boldly penetrated into the heart of Asia. The troops of the frontier and the palace were repeatedly overthrown. The edicts of persecution were answered by the pillage of Nice and Nicomedia, of Ancyra and Ephesus. Nor could the apostle St. John protect from violation his city and sepulchre. The cathedral of Ephesus was turned into a stable for mules and horses, and the Paulicians vied with the Saracens in their contempt and abhorrence of images and relics. It is not unpleasing to observe the triumph of rebellion over the same despotism which had disdained the prayers of an injured people. The emperor Basil, the Macedonian, was reduced to sue for peace, to offer a ransom for the captives, and to request, in the language of moderation and charity, that Chrysocheir would spare his fellow Christians, and content himself with the royal donative of gold and silver and silk garments. If the emperor, replied the insolent fanatic, be desirous of peace, let him abdicate the east and reign without molestation in the west. If he refuse, the servants of the Lord will precipitate him from the throne. The reluctant Basil suspended the treaty, accepted the defiance, and led his army into the land of heresy, which he wasted with fire and sword. The open country of the Paulicians was exposed to the same calamities which they had inflicted. But when he had explored the strength of Tefrica, the multitude of the barbarians, and the ample magazine of arms and provisions, he desisted with a sigh from the hopeless siege. On his return to Constantinople, he labored, by the foundation of convents and churches, to secure the aid of his celestial patrons, of Michael the Archangel and the prophet Elijah, and it was his daily prayer that he might live to transpierce, with three arrows, the head of his impious adversary. Beyond his expectation, the wish was accomplished. After a successful inroad, Chrysocheir was surprised and slain in his retreat, and the rebel's head was triumphantly presented at the foot of the throne. On the reception of this welcome trophy, Basil instantly called for his bow, discharged three arrows with unerring aim, and accepted the applause of the court, who hailed the victory of the royal archer. With Chrysocheir, the glory of the Paulicians faded and withered. On the second expedition of the emperor, the impregnable Tefrique was deserted by the heretics, who sued for mercy or escaped to the borders. The city was ruined, but the spirit of independence survived in the mountains. The Paulicians defended, above a century, their religion and liberty, infested the Roman limits, and maintained their perpetual alliance with the enemies of the empire and the gospel. End of chapter 54, part 1《Chapter 54, Part 1 of the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Mead. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 5, Chapter 54, Part 2. Chapter 54 Origin and Doctrine of the Paulicians Part 2 About the middle of the 8th century, Constantine, surnamed Capronimus by the worshippers of images, had made an expedition into Armenia, and found in the cities of Melitene and Theodosiopolis a great number of Paulicians, his kindred heretics. As a favor or punishment, he transplanted them from the banks of the Euphrates to Constantinople and Thrace, and by this emigration their doctrine was introduced and diffused in Europe. If the sectaries of the metropolis were soon mingled with the promiscuous mass, those of the country struck a deep root in a foreign soil. The Paulicians of Thrace resisted the storms of persecution, 
maintained a secret correspondence with their Armenian brethren, and gave aid and comfort to their preachers, who solicited, not without success, the infant faith of the Bulgarians. In the tenth century they were restored and multiplied by a more powerful colony, which John Zemiscus transported from the Chalibian hills to the valleys of Mount Hamas. The Oriental clergy, who would have preferred the destruction, impatiently sighed for the absence of the Manichaeans. The warlike emperor had felt and esteemed their valor. Their attachment to the Saracens was pregnant with mischief, but on the side of the Danube against the barbarians of Scythia, their service might be useful and their loss would be desirable. Their exile in a distant land was softened by a free toleration. The Paulicians held the city of Philippopolis and the keys of Thrace. The Catholics were their subjects, the Jacobite emigrants their associates. They occupied a line of villages and castles in Macedonia and Epirus, and many native Bulgarians were associated to the communion of arms and heresy. As long as they were awed by power and treated with moderation, their voluntary bands were distinguished in the armies of the empire, and the courage of these dogs, ever greedy of war, ever thirsty of human blood, is noticed with astonishment, and almost with reproach, by the pusillanimous Greeks. The same spirit rendered them arrogant and contumacious. They were easily provoked by caprice or injury, and their privileges were often violated by the faithless bigotry of the government and clergy. In the midst of the Norman War, 2,500 Manichaeans deserted the standard of Alexius Comnenus and retired to their native homes. He dissembled till the moment of revenge, invited the chiefs to a friendly conference, and punished the innocent and guilty by imprisonment, confiscation, and baptism. In an interval of peace, the emperor undertook the pious office of reconciling them to the church and state. His winter quarters were fixed at Philippopolis, and the thirteenth apostle, as he is styled by his pious daughter, consumed whole days and nights in theological controversy. His arguments were fortified, their obstinacy was melted, by the honors and rewards which he bestowed on the most eminent proselytes. And a new city, surrounded with gardens, enriched with immunities, and dignified with his own name, was founded by Alexius, for the residence of his vulgar converts. The important station of Philippopolis was wrested from their hands. The contumacious leaders were secured in a dungeon, or banished from their country, and their lives were spared by the prudence, rather than the mercy, of an emperor, at whose command a poor and solitary heretic was burnt alive before the church of Santa Sophia. But the proud hope of eradicating the prejudices of a nation, was speedily overturned by the invincible zeal of the Paulicians, who ceased to dissemble or refused to obey. After the departure and death of Alexius, they soon resumed their civil and religious laws. In the beginning of the thirteenth century, their pope or primate, a manifest corruption, resided on the confines of Bulgaria, Croatia, and Dalmatia, and governed by his vicars, the filial congregations of Italy and France. From that era, a minute scrutiny might prolong and perpetuate the chain of tradition. At the end of the last age, the sect or colony still inhabited the valleys of Mount Hamas, where their ignorance and poverty were more frequently tormented by the Greek clergy than by the Turkish government. The modern Paulicians have lost all memory of their origin, and their religion is disgraced by the worship of the cross and the practice of bloody sacrifice which some captives have imported from the wilds of Tartary. In the West, the first teachers of the Manichaean theology had been repulsed by the people or suppressed by the prince. The favor and success of the Paulicians in the 11th and 12th centuries must be imputed to the strong, though secret, discontent which armed the most pious Christians against the Church of Rome. Her avarice was oppressive, her despotism odious. Less degenerate perhaps than the Greeks in the worship of saints and images, her innovations were more rapid and scandalous. 
she had rigorously defined and imposed the doctrine of transubstantiation. The lives of the Latin clergy were more corrupt, and the Eastern bishops might pass for the successors of the apostles if they were compared with the lordly prelates who wielded by turns the crozier, the scepter, and the sword. Three different roads might introduce the Paulicians into the heart of Europe. After the conversion of Hungary, the pilgrims who visited Jerusalem might safely follow the course of the Danube. In their journey and return they passed through Philippopolis, and the sectaries, disguising their name and heresy, might accompany the French or German caravans to their respective countries. The trade and dominion of Venice pervaded the coast of the Adriatic, and the hospitable republic opened her bosom to foreigners of every climate and religion. Under the Byzantine standard, the Paulicians were often transported to the Greek provinces of Italy and Sicily. In peace and war they freely conversed with strangers and natives, and their opinions were silently propagated in Rome, Milan, and the kingdoms beyond the Alps. It was soon discovered that many thousand Catholics of every rank and of either sex had embraced the Manichaean heresy, and the flames which consumed twelve canons of Orléans was the first act and the signal of persecution. The Bulgarians, a name so innocent in its origin, so odious in its application, spread their branches over the face of Europe. United in common hatred of idolatry in Rome, they were connected by a form of Episcopal and Presbyterian government. Their various sects were discriminated by some fainter or darker shades of theology, but they generally agreed in the two principles the contempt of the Old Testament, and the denial of the body of Christ, either on the cross or in the Eucharist. A confession of simple worship and blameless manners is extorted from their enemies, and so high was their standard of perfection that the increasing congregations were divided into two classes of disciples, of those who practiced and of those who aspired. It was in the country of the Albigeois, in the southern provinces of France, that the Paulicians were most deeply implanted, and the same vicissitudes of martyrdom and revenge which had been displayed in the neighborhood of the Euphrates were repeated in the thirteenth century on the banks of the Rhone. The laws of the eastern emperors were revived by Frederick the Second. The insurgents of Tefrique were represented by the barons and cities of Languedoc. Pope Innocent the Third surpassed the sanguinary fame of Theodora. It was in cruelty alone that her soldiers could equal the heroes of the Crusades, and the cruelty of her priests was far excelled by the founders of the Inquisition, an office more adapted to confirm than to refute the belief of an evil principle. The visible assemblies of the Paulicians, or Albigeois, were extirpated by fire and sword, and the bleeding remnant escaped by flight, concealment, or Catholic conformity but the invincible spirit which they had kindled still lived and breathed in the Western world. In the state, in the church, and even in the cloister, a latent succession was preserved of the disciples of St. Paul, who protested against the tyranny of Rome, embraced the Bible as the rule of faith, and purified their creed from all the visions of the Gnostic theology. The struggles of Wycliffe in England of Hus and Bohemia, were premature and ineffectual. But the names of Zwinglius, Luther, and Calvin are pronounced with gratitude as the deliverers of nations. A philosopher who calculates the degree of their merit and the value of their reformation will prudently ask from what articles of faith, above or against our reason, they have enfranchised the Christians. For such enfranchisement is doubtless a benefit so far as it may be compatible with truth and piety. After a fair discussion, we shall rather be surprised by the timidity than scandalized by the freedom of our first reformers. With the Jews they adopted the belief and defense of all the Hebrew scriptures, with all their prodigies, from the Garden of Eden to the visions of the prophet Daniel. And they were bound, like the Catholics, to justify against the Jews the abolition of a divine law. In the great mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation, the Reformers were severely orthodox. 
they freely adopted the theology of the four or the six first councils, and with the Athanasian creed they pronounced the eternal damnation of all who did not believe the Catholic faith. Transubstantiation, the invisible change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, is a tenet that may defy the power of argument and pleasantry. But instead of consulting the evidence of their senses, of their sight, their feeling, and their taste, the first Protestants were entangled in their own scruples, and awed by the words of Jesus in the institution of the sacrament. Luther maintained a corporeal, and Calvin a real, presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and the opinion of Zwinglius, that it is no more than a spiritual communion, a simple memorial, has slowly prevailed in the Reformed churches. But the loss of one mystery was amply compensated by the stupendous doctrines of original sin, redemption, faith, grace, and predestination, which have been strained from the epistles of St. Paul. These subtle questions had most assuredly been prepared by the fathers and schoolmen, but the final improvement in popular use may be attributed to the first reformers, who enforced them as the absolute and essential terms of salvation. Hitherto the weight of supernatural belief inclines against the Protestants, and many a sober Christian would rather admit that a wafer is God than that God is a cruel and capricious tyrant. Yet the services of Luther and his rivals are solid and important, and the philosopher must own his obligations to these fearless enthusiasts. 1. By their hands the lofty fabric of superstition, from the abuse of indulgences to the intercession of the Virgin, has been leveled with the ground. Myriads of both sexes of the monastic profession were restored to the liberty and labors of social life. A hierarchy of saints and angels, of imperfect and subordinate deities, were stripped of their temporal power and reduced to the enjoyment of celestial happiness. Their images and relics were banished from the church, and the credulity of the people was no longer nourished with the daily repetition of miracles and visions. The imitation of paganism was supplied by pure and spiritual worship of prayer and thanksgiving, the most worthy of man, the least unworthy of the deity. It only remains to observe whether such sublime simplicity be consistent with popular devotion, whether the vulgar, in the absence of all visible objects, will not be inflamed by enthusiasm, or insensibly subside in languor and indifference. 2. The chain of authority was broken, which restrains the bigot from thinking as he pleases, and the slave from speaking as he thinks. The popes, fathers, and councils were no longer the supreme and infallible judges of the world, and each Christian was taught to acknowledge no law but the Scriptures, no interpreter but his own conscience. This freedom, however, was the consequence rather than the design of the Reformation. The patriot reformers were ambitious of succeeding the tyrants whom they had dethroned. They imposed with equal rigor their creeds and confessions. They asserted the right of the magistrate to punish heretics with death. The pious or personal animosity of Calvin prescribed in Servetus the guilt of his own rebellion, and the flames of Smithfield, in which he was afterwards consumed, had been kindled for the Anabaptists by the zeal of Cranmer. The nature of the tiger was the same, but he was gradually deprived of his teeth and fangs. A spiritual and temporal kingdom was possessed by the Roman pontiff. The Protestant doctors were subjects of an humble rank without revenue or jurisdiction. His degrees were consecrated by the antiquity of the Catholic Church. Their arguments and disputes were submitted to the people, and their appeal to private judgment was accepted beyond their wishes by curiosity and enthusiasm. Since the days of Luther and Calvin, a secret reformation has been silently working in the bosom of the Reformed churches. Many weeds of prejudice were eradicated, and the disciples of Erasmus diffused a spirit of freedom and moderation. The liberty of conscience has been claimed as a common benefit and an alienable right. The free governments of Holland and England introduced the practice of toleration, 
and the narrow allowance of the laws has been enlarged by the prudence and humanity of the times. In the exercise, the mind has understood the limits of its powers, and the words and shadows that might amuse the child can no longer satisfy his manly reason. The volumes of controversy are overspread with cobwebs. The doctrine of a Protestant church is far removed from the knowledge or belief of its private members, and the forms of orthodoxy, the articles of faith, are subscribed with a sigh or a smile by the modern clergy. Yet the friends of Christianity are alarmed at the boundless impulse of inquiry and skepticism. The predictions of the Catholics are accomplished. The web of mystery is unraveled by the Arminians, Arians, and Socinians, whose number must not be computed from their separate congregations, and the pillars of revelation are shaken by those men who preserve the name without the substance of religion, who indulge the license without the temper of philosophy. End of chapter 54, part 2fifty-five, part one, of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, volume five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, volume five, chapter fifty-five, part one. The Bulgarians origin, migrations, and settlement of the Hungarians, their inroads in the east and west, the monarchy of Russia, geography and trade, wars of the Russians against the Greek Empire, conversion of the barbarians. Under the reign of Constantine, the grandson of Heraclius, the ancient barrier of the Danube, so often violated and so often restored, was irretrievably swept away by the new deluge of barbarians. Their progress was favoured by the caliphs, their unknown and accidental auxiliaries. The Roman legions were occupied in Asia, and after the loss of Syria, Egypt, and Africa, the Caesars were twice reduced to the danger and disgrace of defending their capital against the Saracens. If, in the account of this interesting people, I have deviated from the strict and original line of my undertaking, the merit of the subject will hide my transgression, or solicit my excuse. In the East, in the West, in war, in religion, in science, in their prosperity, and in their decay, the Arabians pressed themselves on our curiosity. The first overthrow of the Church and Empire of the Greeks may be imputed to their arms, and the disciples of Mahomet still hold the civil and religious scepter of the Oriental world but the same labour would be unworthily bestowed on the swarms of savages who, between the 7th and the 12th century, descended from the plains of Scythia, in transient inroad or perpetual emigration. Their names are uncouth, their origins doubtful, their actions obscure, their superstition was blind, their valour brutal, and the uniformity of their public and private lives was neither softened by innocence nor refined by policy. The majesty of the Byzantine throne repelled and survived their disorderly attacks. The greater part of these barbarians has disappeared without leaving any memorial of their existence, and the despicable remnant continues, and may long continue, to groan under the dominion of a foreign tyrant. From the antiquities of one Bulgarians, two Hungarians, and three Russians, I shall content myself with selecting such facts as yet deserve to be remembered. The conquest of the four Normans and the monarchy of the five Turks will naturally terminate in the memorable crusades to the Holy Land and the double fall of the city and empire of Constantine. 1. In his march to Italy, Theodoric the Ostrogoth had trampled on the arms of the Bulgarians. After this defeat, the name and the nation are lost during a century and a half and it may be suspected that the same or a similar appellation was revived by strange colonies from the Boristenes, the Tanais, or the Volga. A king of the ancient Bulgaria, 
bequeathed to his five sons a last lesson of moderation and concord. It was received as youth has ever received the counsels of age and experience. The five princes buried their father, divided his subjects and cattle, forgot his advice, separated from each other, and wandered in quest of fortune, till we find the most adventurous in the heart of Italy, under the protection of the exarch of Ravenna. But the stream of emigration was directed or impelled towards the capital. The modern Bulgaria, along the southern banks of the Danube, was stamped with the name and image which it has retained to the present hour. The new conquerors successively acquired, by war or treaty, the Roman provinces of Dardania, Thessaly, and the two Epirus. The ecclesiastical superiority was translated from the native city of Justinian, and, in their prosperous age, the obscure town of Lucnidus, or Acrida, was honoured with the throne of a king and a patriarch. The unquestionable evidence of language attests the descent of the Bulgarians from the original stock of the Sclavonian, or more properly Slavonian race, and the kindred bands of Serbians, Mosnians, Raskians, Croatians, Wallachians, etc., followed either the standard or the example of the leading tribe. From the Euxine to the Adriatic, in the state of captives, or subjects, or allies, or enemies of the Greek Empire, they overspread the land, and the national appellation of the slaves has been degraded by chance or malice from the signification of glory to that of servitude. Among these colonies, the Croatians, or Croats, who now attend the motions of an Austrian army, are the descendants of a mighty people, the conquerors and sovereigns of Dalmatia, the maritime cities, and of these the infant republic of Ragusa, implored the aid and instruction of the Byzantine court, they were advised by the magnanimous Basil to reserve a small acknowledgment of their fidelity to the Roman Empire, and to appease, by an annual tribute, the wrath of these irresistible barbarians. The kingdom of Croatia was shared by eleven Tsopans, of feudatory lords, and their united forces were numbered at sixty thousand horse and one hundred thousand foot. A long sea-coast, indented with capacious harbours, covered with a string of islands, and almost in the sight of the Italian shores, disposed both the natives and strangers to the practice of navigation. The boats, or brigantines of the Croats, were constructed after the fashion of the old Liburnians. One hundred and eighty vessels may excite the idea of a respectable navy, but our seamen will smile at the allowance of ten or twenty or forty men for each of these ships of war. They were gradually converted to the more honourable service of commerce. Yet the Sclavonian pirates were still frequent and dangerous, and it was not before the close of the tenth century that the freedom and sovereignty of the Gulf were effectually vindicated by the Venetian Republic. The ancestors of these Dalmatian kings were equally removed from the use and abuse of navigation. They dwelt in the white Croatia, in the inland regions of Silesia and Little Poland. Thirty days' journey according to the Greek computation, from the Sea of Darkness. The glory of the Bulgarians was confined to a narrow scope both of time and place. In the ninth and tenth centuries, they reigned to the south of the Danube, but the more powerful nations that had followed their emigration repelled all return to the north and all progress to the west. Yet, in the obscure catalogue of their exploits, they might boast an honour which had hitherto been appropriated to the Goths, that of slaying in battle one of the successors of Augustus and Constantine. The Emperor Nikephorus had lost his fame in the Arabian. He lost his life in the Sclavonian War. In his first operations he advanced with boldness and success into the centre of Bulgaria, and burnt the royal court, which was probably no more than an edifice and a village of timber. But while he searched the spoil and refused all offers of treaty, his enemies collected their spirits and their forces. The passes of retreat were insuperably barred, and the trembling Nikephorus was heard to exclaim, Alas, alas, unless we could assume the wings of birds, we cannot hope to escape. Two days he waited his fate in the inactivity of despair. But on the morning of the third, the Bulgarians surprised the camp, and the Roman prince, with the great officers of the empire, were slaughtered in their tents. The body of Valens had been saved from insult, but the head of Nikephorus was exposed on a spear, and his skull, 
and chased with gold, was often replenished in the feasts of victory. The Greeks bewailed the dishonor of the throne, but they acknowledged the just punishment of avarice and cruelty. This savage cup was deeply tinctured with the manners of the Scythian wilderness, but they were softened before the end of the same century by a peaceful intercourse with the Greeks, the possession of a cultivated region, and the introduction of Christian worship. The nobles of Bulgaria were educated in the schools and palace of Constantinople, and Simeon, a youth of the royal line, was instructed in the rhetoric of Demosthenes and the logic of Aristotle. He relinquished the profession of a monk for that of a king and warrior, and in his reign of more than forty years, Bulgaria assumed a rank among the civilized powers of the earth. The Greeks, whom he repeatedly attacked, derived a faint consolation from indulging themselves in the reproaches of perfidy and sacrilege. They purchased the aid of the pagan Turks, but Simon, in a second battle, redeemed the loss of the first, at a time when it was esteemed a victory to elude the arms of that formidable nation. The Serbians were overthrown, made captive and dispersed, and those who visited the country before the restoration could discover no more than fifty vagrants, without women or children, who exhorted a precarious subsistence of the chase. On classic ground, on the banks of Achelous, the Greeks were defeated. The horn was broken by the strength of the barbaric Hercules. He formed the siege of Constantinople, and, in a personal conference with the emperor, Simeon imposed the conditions of peace. They met with the most jealous precautions. The royal gallery was drawn close to an artificial and well-fortified platform, and the majesty of the purple was emulated by the pomp of the Bulgarian. Are you a Christian? said the humble Romanus. It is your duty to abstain from the blood of your fellow Christians. Has the thirst of riches seduced you from the blessings of peace? Sheathe your sword, open your hand, and I will satiate the utmost measure of your desires. The reconciliation was sealed by a domestic alliance. The freedom of trade was granted or restored. The first honours of the court were secured to the friends of Bulgaria, above the ambassadors of enemies or strangers, and her princes were dignified with the high and invidious title of Basileus, or emperor. But this friendship was soon disturbed. After the death of Simeon, the nations were again in arms. His feeble successors were divided and distinguished, and, in the beginning of the eleventh century, the second Basil, who was born in the purple, deserved the appellation of conqueror of the Bulgarians. His avarice was in some measure gratified by a treasure of four hundred thousand pounds sterling, that is, ten thousand pounds weight of gold, which he found in the palace of Lucnidus. His cruelty inflicted a cool and exquisite vengeance on fifteen thousand captives who had been guilty in the defense of their country. They were deprived of sight, but to one of each hundred a single eye was left, that he may conduct his blind century to the presence of their king. Their king is said to have expired of grief and horror. The nation was awed by this terrible example. The Bulgarians were swept away from their settlements, and circumscribed within a narrow province. The surviving chiefs bequeathed to their children the advice of patience and the duty of revenge. 2. When the black swarm of Hungarians first hung over Europe, Above nine hundred years after the Christian era, they were mistaken by fear and superstition for the Gog and Magog of the scriptures, the signs and forerunners of the end of the world. Since the introduction of letters, they have explored their own antiquities with a strong and laudable impulse of patriotic curiosity. The rational criticism can no longer be amused with a vain pedigree of Attila and the Huns, but they complain that their primitive records have perished in the Tartar war, that the truth or fiction of their rustic songs is long since forgotten, and that the fragments of a crude chronicle must be painfully reconciled with the contemporary, though foreign intelligence of the imperial geographer. Magyar is the national and oriental denomination of the Hungarians, but among the tribes of Scythia, they are distinguished by the Greeks under the proper and peculiar name of Turks, as the descendants of the mighty people who had conquered and reigned from China to the Volga. The Pannonian colony preserved a correspondence of trade and amity with the eastern Turks on the confines of Persia, and after a separation of 350 years, 
the missionaries of the king of Hungary, discovered and visited their ancient country near the banks of the Volga. They were hospitably entertained by a people of pagans and savages, who still bore the name of Hungarians, conversed in their native tongue, recollected the tradition of long-lost brethren, and listened with amazement to the marvellous tale of their new kingdom and religion. The seal of conversion was animated by the interest of consanguinity, and one of the greatest of their princes had formed the generous, though fruitless, design of replenishing the solitude of Pannonia by this domestic colony from the heart of Tartary. From this primitive country they were driven to the west by the tide of war and emigration, by the weight of the more distant tribes, who at the same time were fugitives and conquerors. Reason or fortune directed their course towards the frontiers of the Roman Empire. They halted in the usual stations along the banks of the great rivers, and in the territories of Moscow, Kiev, and Moldavia, some vestiges have been discovered of their temporary residence. In this long and various peregrination, they could not always escape the dominion of the stronger, and the purity of their blood was improved or sullied by the mixture of a foreign race. From the motive of compulsion or choice, several tribes of the Khazars were associated to the standard of their ancient vassals, introduced the use of a second language, and obtained by their superior renown the most honorable place in the front of battle. The military force of the Turks and their allies marched in seven equal and artificial divisions. Each division was formed of 30,857 warriors, and the proportions of women, children, and servants supposes and requires at least a million of emigrants. Their public councils were directed by seven vaivods, or hereditary chiefs, but the experience of discord and weakness recommended the more simple and vigorous administration of a single person. The scepter, which had been declined by the modest Libedias, was granted to the birth or merit of Almus and his son Arpad, and the authority of the supreme Khan of the Khazars confirmed the engagement of the prince and people, or the people to obey his commands, or the prince to consult their happiness and glory. With this narrative we might be reasonably content, if the penetration of modern learning had not opened a new and larger prospect of the antiquities of nations. The Hungarian language stands alone, and as it were insulated, among the Sclavonian dialects, but it bears a close and clear affinity to the idioms of the Fenic race, of an obsolete and savage race which formerly occupied the northern regions of Asia and Europe. The genuine applications of Ugri or Igurs is found on the western confines of China. Their migrations to the banks of the Irtish is attested by Tartar evidence. A similar name and language are detected in the southern parts of Siberia, and the remains of the Fenic tribes are widely, though thinly scattered from the sources of the Obi to the shores of Lapland. The consanguinity of the Hungarians and Laplanders would display the powerful energy of climate on the children of a common parent. The lively contrast between the bold adventurers who are intoxicated with the wines of the Danube, and the wretched fugitives who are immersed beneath the snows of the polar circle. Arms and freedom have ever been the ruling, though too often the unsuccessful passions of the Hungarians, who are endowed by nature with a vigorous constitution of soul and body. Extreme cold has diminished the stature, and congealed the faculties of the Laplanders, and the Arctic tribes, alone among the sons of men, are ignorant of war, and unconscious of human blood. A happy ignorance, if reason and virtue were the guardians of their peace. End of chapter 55, part 1. Recording by Monsbro, Helsingfors, Finland.